Maybe your hometown celebrates long-standing Swiss traditions, cow chip throwing, or even classic car muscle. Everyone has a hometown, and every hometown has a festival. Senex wants to hear about yours. That's why we're launching the Hometown Throwdown. Tell us about your fest, and it could win one hundred thousand dollars. Learn more at senexhometownthrowdown.com. Senex, powered locally. Let the train! You are listening to Why the Truck. Are you ready to truck it? It's time for your Nooner with Dooner. What's happening, everybody? Where am I? I'm a big red box. What's going on, guys? You're going to bring me up here? Wrong camera. <laughs> That's going to come into play a little bit later, though, because I got challenged to an ice bucket challenge. Sorry, right before we went on air, we had to sort of move things around because we're going to dump a bucket of water on my head at the end of the show. And um, there's a lot of equipment over here, so I got to go do it over there. Uh, guys, I got to start off with bad news. And uh, we've been following the story. If you've been following this show, you know all about that yellow situation. Well, today looks like the end of the line. I just got a report from uh, a number of people over there. Management has been let go with two weeks of severance. But I think this one is even more impactful. This is a driver. This is uh, We've shown several of his videos as long as we've been covering Yellow. And this is uh, Donna Wright, 40. He posted this on TikTok this morning. He's been giving us a boots-on-the-ground take on what it's like at Yellow. And here's what he had to say today. Well... Today might be the last day. Let me tell you guys how I know that. When I came in this morning, I pick up my DR. My DR is my uh, delivery paperwork. Um, most of the bills have drivers, driver collect, meaning that we don't deliver the freight unless the customer give us a check for those freight with no invoice. I was told to just let the freight go. Don't worry about how much they owe, just release the freight, they're not holding no freight. That means everything confirmed that this company is done. I was hoping and praying that it didn't come down to this. I try to remain positive. I didn't want anyone to come to this channel and get negative news. I'm hoping that I'm wrong. But at this point, I don't think it's. It, it, I don't think we can say yellow anymore. Um, whoever's remain here, I guess we the we. I guess we the cleanup crew. We clearing out the warehouse. Whatever freight that's in the system, we will be delivering them. A lot of people call me delusional or crazy. I'm not delusional and I'm not crazy. I'm just a driver who have family to take care of that have hope that I can keep my job. You know, and uh, now I will still keep you guys updated. I will remain here to the end. I made a promise to you guys. I'm going to remain strong. I'm going to stay here. Do I have hope Yellow can be saved? I don't know at this point, but I know they're still in D.C. negotiating. They could be laughing at us at that point, or they could be um, trying to save the company. It, it, is, it is what it is. So, um, I, and, and I know a comment asks if I'm getting paid for, from Yellow for reporting this. I'm not getting paid from Yellow. Man, Yellow don't even have no money to stay in business. You think they'll pay me for reporting Yellow? Come on, bro. But anyway, uh, I'm just trying to remain positive. I'm just trying to bring good news. Uh, anything I report is what I'm told here at this terminal. I can't talk about nobody else's terminals but my own, but where I work at, what I'm seeing, facts, what I'm seeing here, where I'm at in Miami. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate everybody comment, good or bad, that's what this channel is all about. Let's keep the comment coming. But all I know right now, that's it. Say goodbye to Yellow. Now it's time for me to start talking about plan B. What do I do after Yellow? But like I said yesterday, I'm going down with the ship. I'm gonna keep you guys updated to the end. I wanna film the chain 
going on that gate. The chain going on the door. I'm gonna film all that. All right. Y'all have a good day. Peace. God bless that guy. God bless that guy. Chris Mayberry, he says, I hate this. And even more so for those with pensions who disappeared uh, after decades of dedication to YRC um, and their subsidiaries. Danny Morales, God bless the driver. Someone offer him a job. I can feel how sincere he is and a loyal person. I agree. You know, usually when these, these shutdowns happen, I always call out to you guys, the audience, and I say, hey, w- what do you have available? Who can you help out there? And the weird thing is, usually... I get a ton of responses, right? In this one, and I think it's indicative of the market, I haven't really heard from many of you yet about what you have for opportunities from these drivers. I know we had that gentleman in from Plogger on here, but guys, if you have stuff, let me know. I'll be sure to help amplify that and get some good homes from these people. We see a lot of headlines. You see the headlines, yellow going bankrupt, right? That's not tangible. What's tangible is seeing the actual impact that is happening to people on the ground. We're talking about 30,000 workers here that are losing their jobs. This is, by the way, that was, that was um, Miami that he was in. These are the warehouses over in Charlotte right now. They're just clearing things out right out now. If you have freight with them, I'm sure you're panicking a little bit looking for all of this stuff. Many of you, you already diverted your stuff. We're already seeing it here in the data. ArcBest reported that less than truckload shipments from core accounts have increased by 10% in the last week. So you've been smart, you've been listening. I know Donner over there was trying to be optimistic that things were going to improve. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Now, you might have saw the headline yesterday. Yellow is trying to offload its 3PL division. It's trying to find a buyer at the last minute. I hope it's not to pay for that last two weeks of severance. I asked if Elon should come in. Why not? Elon Musk asked my audience. Fortunately, most people said no. I don't necessarily think he would do a great job with Yellow, but it is Twitter or X nowadays. Could be a platform for the semi. I don't know. It's tough. We're going to get more into this a little bit later into the show. And like I said again, my email address is tduner at freightwaves.com. You got anything for these guys? That's two O's, D O O N E R. Got anything for these guys? Email me. You can find me on social media. Just look up Timothy Dooner. I'll be heard. Help. I'll be happy to put a post together and let people know what's going on. Um, what do we got going on today? We got CNBC's Lorianne LaRocco. She's going to come on. She's going to tell us all about West Coast labor port action. What's going on there? Plus. She has some bad news about what may be going on with uh, consumer spending and, and that kind of thing. I'm excited to get into that one. We have trucks. It's Joe Stevens and Kevin O'Brien. They're coming on here to talk about, uh, well, J- um, Joe, for example, he's got a great story. He came from an owner-operator owning hundreds of assets to now building a, what, I don't know, maybe they won't agree with me, but from what I've read, it sounds almost like a dating app for freight. It connects the uh, the drivers with the carriers, the bumble of freight. We'll, we'll see if that's true. And then we got Hellbent Express's Jamie Hagan. He comes from the School of Maconomics. I'm going to show you guys in a little bit just how, um, how, how, how fuel has been skyrocketing. He is all about, you know, driving uh, driving the right speed limit, keeping that 10 miles per gallon plus, especially as inflation could be creeping in with, with fuel, oil, and all that stuff coming up. I got an ice bucket challenge to do later. We got milk tankers getting filled and a bunch of stuff, but this has already taken long enough, so let me tip the band and we'll get to some guests. What the Truck is sponsored by Last Mile Delivery Leader Freight. When you need the best Last Mile Delivery drivers and vehicles, look to Freight. Sign up and get your first three deliveries free, up to 300 bucks. Go to Freight.com and use the code FIRST3FREE. That's Freight, F-R-A-Y-T.com. Now it's Joe Stevens, CEO, and Kevin O'Brien, CSO, at, am I saying this right? Is it Truxit? Traxit. Truxit. 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 Now, the, to my right, the first one here, that's your Kevin, right? That's correct, sir. Kevin, where are you coming in from? I like the uh, I like the backdrop you have going on there. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. So I'm coming in from Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, I you know every Cincy guy because so Ellie De La Cruz was was on the Chattanooga lookouts out here. So every Cincy guy, I got to tell you guys, like I'm a I'm kind of been following the Reds now because Ellie's a sensation. I don't know if you're a fan. Of course. Reds, <laughs> 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 right? Yeah, and, and Joe, you're the you're the CEO over there. Uh, you know, you heard you heard the driver talking. You know the yellow news. Yeah. I saw your yeah. you made a comment on on LinkedIn. Any any take on this? You know, it, it, it's it's tragic, is what it is. Anytime you see uh, an organization that large, that much scope and breadth, we we've seen it over the past few years. A lot of trucking companies that, for whatever reason, have gone by the wayside. It's an absolute tragedy, not only for the consumer. The industry, the perception, but I tell you, it's terrible for the drivers. They say, you know, drivers will get another job. Well, that, that's not really the point. Yeah. The point is, is that they put their heart and soul into an organization that they've represented, worked very, very hard, and for whatever reason, beyond their control, 
a, a company decides to go a different way or a different direction, or in this case, not exist at all. Uh, it's tragic. It's very tragic. I hate it. I hate to see it for the industry. Yeah, it's a, it's a dark day. I mean, it's the biggest it's the biggest trucking bankruptcy in history. I mean, it's twice as big as uh, as CF. Yep, yep, it is. It is, and it's just tragic. And uh, you know, will the drivers find a job? Sure, they'll find a job without a doubt. There's plenty of opportunities out there, and I employ the same thing you said, Dooner. If you have jobs for these drivers, reach out, post whatever that looks like. Uh, to make sure that we can satisfy all their needs, to support their family, and continue to do what they do best, and that serve us. Because without the truck driver, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. Amen. And a little, a little cowbell, a little cowbell for that. I mean, it, it, it it's a hard day. You know, freight always keeps moving, though. Freight always keeps moving, and in a market like this, we got to find tools. We got to find ways to. To, to find drivers freight and and to be economical and with fuel increasing to survive this thing. Now, Kevin, did I describe this well as as sort of like a, almost a dating app for freight, where it it pairs the carrier with the uh, with the driver and the freight? That that's pretty, that's absolutely pretty accurate with regard to uh, a dating app. I love it. As a matter of fact, so the story coin that, here. And by I, the way, dude. what's that? <laughs> absolutely, we're, we're, we're going to coin that phrase. By the way, the dating app of trucking. Yes. <laughs> you where where so, you where the so driver well, makes the first move. Where's it that's the shipper? Right, that's right. <laughs> well, it, it's not the tender for trucking, just yeah. to be clear. Just to be clear. Well, how does it work? What's the elevator pitch on what you all do? So Joe, you want to take that or you want me to? No, go ahead, Kevin. All right, outstanding. So the short story here is that Trucks It was born of an idea by owner operators for owner operators, right? So the short story again is that you know it, when you look at, at at brokerages, they're they're earning give or take 30, 35 percent of an owner operator's hard earned money, right? Um, it, obviously, that's it's a market that needs to be, or it's a it's a, 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 a service that needs to be there, right? But it's been I want to say bastardized, if you will. Um, owner operators basically being taken advantage of to the tune of 30, 35%, right? So along comes a concept, and Dooner, I love it, the dating app of, of trucking, right? Along comes the concept to be able to create an app that simply points out the closest load to you, points out a very clear uh, pricing structure to the owner operator, um, and gives them the ability not only to, to grab that load, right there on the spot instead of sitting around a Loves or a TA trying to make phone calls and, and find a load, shortens deadhead, um, you know, and, and gets you on the road faster to actually make some money. The other thing it does is it gives you a litany yeah, of, of opportunity around uh, where you are, right? So you drop a load in, in South Dakota and, and, and your other load cancels. Well, you can hop on the app and, and look for a new load. Um, it's clear, it's concise. It's real time. Um, we've also, uh, we won't have ghost loads. So you can look at this as a, a free load board, if you will, right? It's no cost. Um, we've actually built uh, uh, rewards programs or building rewards programs uh, around uh, miles driven, et cetera. So we found, we found a niche that needed to be filled. We figured out that from this perspective, brokerage needed to be brought into the 21st century. Right. Yeah. Um, Uber Freight is doing something similar, but we've got some benefits and features that are above what they're doing. And the biggest piece of this, Dooner, the biggest piece of this is that we're paying 7.5% on average more back to the driver. Right. And there's a lot more to the story, but that's the short yeah. end. Of we'll, we'll get into it. We'll get into, I want to put some context. I want to put some context. So, Joe, let's go back to you. You're not some Silicon Valley theorist, right? You're not some guy who just, you know, saw the, the spot market going crazy during COVID and said trucking is the business for me. You have put your blood, sweat and tears in this. You started out as an owner operator. Take us inside your background on this journey a little bit. Yeah, the, the journey's been great. Dinner. I mean, it, I've been in transportation, logistics and supply chain for 40 years. Uh, I literally started out the very pinnacle of the industry. I started out as a driver. Uh, I started out as an owner operator. I also drove company for a number of years, and I drove a million and a half incident-free, accident-free miles uh, while I was driving. The very best experience of my life and my career. I still reflect on that part of my career today. 
Uh, but while I was driving, I, I, I wanted to own my own trucking company. So I did. I jumped out of the truck and my goal was to have six or eight trucks in my fleet. Uh, but over time, that grew to over 650 trucks, predominantly an owner operator model by design because I didn't have any capital to invest into this new company. What I did have, though, are with the alliances and friendships uh, that I had made over the road over 10 years to come join me. And my assurance to them was, you join me, I'll keep you running. So it was a very fast pace. It was an outstanding opportunity, made wonderful friendships, wonderful people, and was fortunate enough to have my company bought uh, in 2007. Uh, I shared all the profits with every single driver and every single employee of the company because without them, uh, JMS Transport would have not been what it was. Uh, after I sold my company, I retired for about 10 minutes and um, have held a couple of leadership roles since then, most notably uh, vice president of operations and driver development for UST Select. I uh, was heavily involved with CR England operations and England logistics brokerage. Uh, I was president of XPO logistics for a number of years. Uh, and as, I, as you alluded to, I'm currently CEO of Truxit. Um, so it's been a full circle for me. I'm very passionate about the owner operator model. There are 800,000 owner operators in the marketplace today. Before an owner operator, th this is staggering information that they have a lease payment or a truck payment. They have fuel, they have insurance, they have tolls that equates anywhere between 2,500 to 2,850 a month before they even move their truck. It employs all four of us, Kevin and I and our other two partners, along with all of our technology team and customer support team, to make a, a, a stand on how we can support, provide a better support structure than what the traditional support, support structure is today for that owner-operator. Additionally, being able to provide the shippers uh, an additional capacity that may otherwise they may not have. So this is something that is very, very passionate for me. Uh, we've been only uh, designing this for the last 11 months, Dooner. Uh, we are going to launch here very, very soon, uh, in addition to some other support structures that we are currently working on that Kevin will outline that will bring this entire Truxit uh, universe uh, to, to, to the owner-operator model, the consumer, uh, and, and shippers. Yeah, Kevin, now we can go to that thing. Now I'm curious, what makes you different than the other girls? In this case, the girls being Uber Freight and, and other load boards. I love the way you put that question. So we are the we are the the uh, extreme dating app, if you will, of trucking. Um, short story is that we figured out while we were building this that we were going to need some support structure along with it, right? So what's important to the owner-operator? Finding a load, reducing deadhead, uh, reducing that cost, being able to pick uh, the best load for them at the time, and then the cash piece of it, right? The actual payment process, getting paid it, it as quickly as possible. I mean, your, your audience is well aware that it, it can take up to 21 days to get paid once you drop the load. We're reducing that to, to two hours to 48 hour time frame with electronic POD. Um, so we needed a cash app at the same time. So inside of that, we also built trucks at cash. So we're gonna be dropping a, a full-blown cash app powered by MasterCard to pay the owner operator much more quickly. Um, it, it kills the, the factoring piece um, and it's next level. The next piece of it is that <clears throat> we also figured out that, you know, obviously, or we knew uh, that the owner operators needed, needed stuff, right? Maybe a headset, maybe a T-shirt, you know, maybe maybe a safety vest. You name it. So we opened Truckset.shop. We're launching a program where uh, you'll be able to use rewards for miles driven for trucks at cash, and you can turn around and spend that at trucks at shop or elsewhere if you wish. So, no, it sounds it sounds uh, sounds how uh, where did, like people who want to get a demo of this or, or get the user experience and all that kind of stuff, where would they go to to sort of check that out? Please go to truxit.app, truxit.shop, and truxit.cash. Now, Joe, I got to tell you. Tomorrow, though, like, Joe, I gotta tomorrow you. We're, we're rolling out our new website tomorrow, truxit.com, oh, which okay. will have all of these caveats related to it. 
That's how I'm going to spend my weekend, looking at the website. No, well, they'll probably check it out Monday. It'll be, it'll be up and running by then. But, Joe, before I, I let you go, what's your prediction? Q3, Q4, we in for hurt? We in for, eh, got to be smart? I think we're gonna, I think we're going to stay kind of flat right now. I think the RPM is going to stay pretty much where it is, unfortunately. I think we're probably looking Q1 2024, uh, where we'll see a little bit of relief from the RPM uh, that we've kind of been stagnant over the next, several for the last, what, 18 months now. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the way I see it. All right. Well, hey, go get matched. Go get matched with your freight on Tracks. Go check it out. Check out their new website this weekend. Guys, thank you for coming on the show and sharing your insights. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dooner. Appreciate it. Dude. Take, thank take you. care. All right, everybody. Meanwhile. Connor, Dr. Jones is going to make his grand entrance for you. Which door do you think he's going to come through? Uh, the left one. Purple? Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's find out. My mother will laugh at this one, because when I was like a kid, I think the first job I ever told her I wanted to be was a dancing dentist. Yes. I mean, this is cool, but it's also a little, like, when you're a kid, oh, yeah. this is cool. When you're an adult, it's a little more creepy, because it's like, ah, oh, Mr. Mr. Willy Wonka man with the flashing shoes. I don't know. I don't know. Let's talk to Lori Ann LaRocco, senior editor of Guess, over at CNBC. You look great today. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing good. Hard day. I you probably heard the yellow news. I know you're not as is you're more ocean than trucking, but it's it's not easy. No, it's definitely not easy. And even though we all know that the capacity can be met, you know, we're talking about human we're talking about people's lives. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, there are unintended consequences when it comes to things like this. Um, and when you look beyond the supply chain, in the end, trade takes people. So it is a hard time. Lorianne, I always look to you, uh, you and Greg Miller and Sal Mercagliano for my ocean news. And I've been following you on this strike stuff. And I'm, I'm getting whiplash between this and yellow, like my and, and all this labor action. My head is going nuts. And like, I see your report and I'm all happy. And I'm like, look, there's this turmoil. Oh, good. UPS just got solved. Oh, good. That port strike up in Canada got solved. Hey, and maybe even yellow. They, they said that they might. And then like, not all of that worked out. UPS was fine, but everyone else still turmoil. Labor action back at the port. Tell us what's happening. Sure. So uh, today is the second day of voting uh, for uh, the Canadian uh, West Coast workers at the ports. And, you know, they're voting on the tentative deal. And you and I both know a deal is not done until every union worker votes on it. And that also includes with UPS. I mean, you know, they have said yes to the tentative deal. They will, you know, they're voting on it. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where with the supply chain, nobody likes uncertainty. And, you know, you have seen between the blank sailings, uh, between the vessels that were rerouted, uh, the port of Vancouver and Prince Rupert, they are going to hurt. And I have spoken with logistics managers who have told me that their clients have told them under no circumstances will I ever go back to Vancouver. And that's a big deal because, you know, even though that the longshoremen are going to get their fair share or whatever they're asking for in the end, there will be less trade going through Canada. And that does, in the end, as you know, impact uh, a country's GDP. Now, didn't did the did I hear this correct? The ILWU said they're not going to touch diverted Canada freight. That's correct. And so you and I both know when it comes to trade, there's that digital bill of lading, right? The receipt for the container. So if you reconsign your container, you know, there's no way for them to really know that that was like, say, a Vancouver bound or Prince Rupert bound container. But I did speak with one of my contacts within one of the terminals and they told me that and it makes sense after they said this. So every vessel, when it comes to a string, the longshoremen know that around this time of year, they're saying maybe 800 containers, right? They're going to take off. But what happens if that same vessel that comes in has a thousand containers coming in? That's a red flag for them to let to for them to know that there are rediverted containers. And so I have been told that you have had LIWU workers go into um, you know into the office to check the bills of lading in Tacoma to see if they are indeed um, you know diverted containers. I do know that down uh, in the port of Los Angeles, things were moving a little bit slower. Long Beach, things were moving a little bit slower. Um, So the ILWU, I guess, are trying to make best efforts in terms of trying to track down that trade. They're not going to 
you know, catch every single one of them. It is yet to be revealed if anything has been denied. Mm. But I think it's more of that matching of solidarity of saying, like, we're checking things. Mm. Well, uh, speaking of solidarity, will they be joining them in striking in solidarity? We still don't have a contract down on our own West Coast ports over here, Lori. This seems like that that's on notice, too. You know, well, I've asked Willie Adams countless times, probably to nauseam. He probably doesn't want to ever hear from me again. But, you know, I have asked, you know, what are you going to do? And they say in that nebulous terms that we're going to stand in solidarity. We know that Willie went up there. You know, they, you know, stood, stood side by side uh, with Rob Ashton, who's the head of the, the union up in Canada. Uh, but their, their way of standing in solidarity is to make sure that the trade that they're moving uh, is not Canadian freight. Again, that's next to impossible for them to really know. They are in the process right now of having the various union unions vote on this deal. We might not know until September, but it's interesting because when you look at the time frame, when it came to the signing of that deal, it wasn't the, the fact that Secretary Shu flew in there and, you know, magically, you know, created this, you know, kumbaya. It was the fact that you are approaching the one year deadline in terms of the collective bargaining. And so it was imperative that the union had a deal because if they didn't have a deal, Tim, by the end of that year, there'd be no retroactive pay. And that would impact all the union members that, of course, you know, currently work there. But more importantly, the men and women who are looking to retire. And so I really think when it comes to the time frame, I think, you know, if they by some chance say no, I don't know what that means, because I don't know if that throws a wrench into the back pay process. I'm not I'm not a legal attorney. I've been trying to find that out. Can the ports learn anything from Yellow? Yellow had this big issue where there are a bunch of a bunch of different companies that came together. They never homogenized until it was too late. They tried to do the one yellow. They've been trying to do it for years now. I'm not entirely blaming the union, but in a lot of ways, the union stood in the way of that happening. And then over in the port SoCal, a big sticking point is like, look, there's got to be a realization here. You, you look out at the most efficient ports in the world, right? The U.S. is near the bottom of the barrel. They need some modernization and they need some changes. Are, are they ever going to find a sticking point here that makes us a, like a powerhouse of the port or at least gets us in the middle of the pack? I don't think they ever will because the union's way too powerful. I mean, when you look at when you look at the argument of automation, when you look at the argument of, yes, the job will be automated, but it'll be a better paying job. Right. Because you yourself would have the tools right to oversee whatever the item is. I think when it comes to the power of the union. I think that, you know, you do see that cowtail. You do see that push, that, that pullback, if you will. I mean, the one, the, the telltale sign when you looked at the port strife, right, on the West Coast, it was, um, it was, um, it was the port uh, down, down further south in Los Angeles, uh, when I, where they're not automated. They can't be automated. And so you knew the union members were ticked off in solidarity when the union workers who have no threat of automation walked off the job. And that was the first time in well over a decade that those men and women walked off that job. And so I really don't know if we'll ever get that automation that we need for us to be competitive, to really effectively move that freight. But then also too, it trade is more than the ports, it's the trucks, it's the rails. And look at what's going on right now with AB5 and the electrification of the trucks. There are so many different headwinds to really, that will really prevent fluidity. Um, it, it's gotta be all encompassed in terms of every stakeholder really has to put on their big boy pants and really come to a decision of how are we going to collectively move this nation forward to effectively move the freight not only efficiently through the port, but on the rails, which we know they have problems. And of course, the truck drivers, which have had their own set of headwinds. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned rail there. So is this strike up in Canada? Is that impacting rail at all? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually uh, waiting to hear back from Norfolk Southern to see how it might be impacting them. So as w uh, for those that might not be aware, so 15 percent of our trade come from the port from the ports of uh, Vancouver and 60 percent of our rail trade comes that comes out of Prince Rupert comes down to us. And so that's a lot of trade. And so I started looking at the uh, the railroad data coming from Canada to the United States and it was down 
for the first two weeks of that strike down over 80%. So that is a lot of trade that is not coming in. It's going to be delayed. That one day where we had that on again, off again drama, we saw you know trade down again another week. It wasn't down as much. It was down about 12%. But all in all, after I spoke with the uh, Association of Railroads for Canada, they told me, you're looking at 78 days, Tim, to to clear up the congestion, 78 days. That includes chemicals, that includes back to school, that includes auto parts. All of that is gummed up in the system. And I've been speaking with folks who have their intermodal uh, st- uh, boxes just sitting at the terminal because there's nowhere to go. Uh, that That is challenging. You know, you just sent me a report that said another nail in the consumer spending coffin. And one of these first charts here is showing vacancies on the East Coast. What is, what is, and look at Savannah. I mean, that just, that looks like that fuel chart I showed earlier just skyrocketed up. Yeah. This is insane. I mean, this is why it's so important for logistics managers, right? Or even CEOs out there. Your folks really have to know what the heck is going on in every portion of the trade pipe. This is showing you two things. So it's showing you uh, the pullback, if you will, right, of the of, of a return to the just in time mentality of inventory, which is fine. But it also shows you the flip side of retailers really forecasting the fact that they're not anticipating a very strong holiday season. I did a survey on CNBC with CNBC with the National Retail Federation, the American Apparel Footwear Association. And, you know, those those individuals told me they were bringing in lower price product, lower price products, as well as more promotional products, not the luxury goods like we saw last year that moved. And also they said they still had inventory left in the warehouse. But when you look at that chart, you're like, geez, Louise, how much inventory is really in there, right, in terms of the holidays? So it gives you that forward-looking indicator, if you will, of just how possibly bearish we are looking at. But then twofold, that is something that's ugly for logistics. If I was a, tr- if I was a, a middle mile, final mile uh, truck driver, I would not want to see that. Because that means that there's going to be less stuff leaving that warehouse to go to the retail store this holiday season. So there's a multitude of different forward-looking indicators when you're looking at that chart. Interesting. Now, I'm looking at the, the West Coast, too, with Los Angeles opening up. Inland Empire, big, big jump up on the West Coast one. Um, Oakland is, uh, Oakland's kind of been all over the place. Yeah, Oakland. I mean, Oakland's like it's like this ugly stepchild between the problems at the ports to, you know, the the problems that they have just in general. I think it's it's that reflection of that up and down. Right. Because it's not as fluid as it as it needs to be. But when it comes to the just in time. Right. And, And, you know, the men and women that that drive in day in and day out that listen to your show here, they know very well when it comes to that just-in-time two-day turnaround, it is imperative to really have those distribution centers in the United in the middle of the United States. And this chart represents that type of strength. And so when you're looking at where am I going to move my my trucks, where where is those pockets of opportunity, it really does reside right now in the Midwest because you know, folks need to get their product when it comes to, you know, the middle part of America. You know, we, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about, if you show us next one, your ocean booking charts. I was talking to Henry Byers about that one. He was saying, hey, that doesn't look good. This is a leading indicator on what's going to happen in peak season. And there's not, a, there's not a ton of volume coming in. No, and if you really look at it, that chart that I chose is actually, it's all of the United States. It's all of the ports, rather, to the United States. I didn't just pull China. Just because we already know that China manufact- China orders are down 30 to 40 percent. So we already know it's going to be ugly. But that's every country that we import from. That's ugly. And so if you are banking on any type of peak season, I'm calling it peak season as P-E-A-K-E-D, which is, you know, peak it. You know, it's just not good. It's sickly. And so when you look year over year, we all know the tremendous amount of volumes came in in the springtime of 2022 because people were afraid of getting clogged up in that congestion. So we automatically know that this year's peak peak season year on year is going to be lopsided because your apples to apples is really not apples to apples. It's apples to watermelons at this point. But when you're looking at the lack of uh, inventory coming in, this really shows you that if you are a logistics company, you really have to start differentiating yourself again with 
service and how, how you, your branding and the relationships. This is key. In times like this, this is where you see the pockets of opportunity. With yellow, it's unfortunate, but it's a pocket of opportunity to grab more uh, capacity. And if you are able to deliver right during times like this, it's, you know, this will help set you up for the future. Now, what if we look at regional level on storage on here, too? I found this one really, really curious. And if you're looking at, well, Midwest is really big up here. We're looking kind of flat over here, and then you get West popping up again, too. Yeah, no, I mean, it just shows you, even with uh, the, the uh, on the West Coast, we've all seen, right, the decline of, uh, of trade coming in, right, as we saw that massive uh movement right towards the east coast because of covid They're, they haven't really brought back i always say trade is sticky they have seen a uh, an increase if you will in the teus for uh the peak season right as we're gearing up but it hasn't really stuck and that also translates into if you got less product coming in you really don't need the vacancy you really don't need the warehousing but the interesting part of all this the pricing hasn't caught up with the decline and so, you know, in the future, when you're looking at all, all this, of course, when you see the steep, you know, Mount Everest, right, in certain parts for the Midwest, you know, the pricing is going to stay stable. But when you look at the West Coast, eventually those those rates are going to go down. And so that is actually good news, if you will, you know, for those that are you know, trying to, you know, bring some items in and have it for inventory. Lori, thank you for giving us some clarity in this uh, very uncertain market. I think that's how you start out talking is uncertain. I mean, the only thing that's certain now is that largest bankruptcy in trucking history is basically bound to happen. Um, Lori, people who want to follow you, they need to stay. They, and people do stay on top of this ocean stuff because look, look at all the co- look, look at the issues people are having right now with cash and with capital. Right? There's a bunch of strikes yeah. over there. Freight rates start going through the roof. That's not a good time. Yeah. For, this is not 2020. This is not 2021. This is not 2022 where there's a ton of volume and everything. Now there's a lot yeah. of excess capacity. There's going to be some bleeding out. And you put a ton of cost pressure in there. These bankruptcies are going to skyrocket. And I'm not just talking about carriers, man. I'm talking about I'm talking about brokers. I'm talking about anyone who has to do at least i'm talking about i'm talking about shippers too exactly because you know you pointed out it's it's not just the one thing it's the entirety i mean trade impacts so many different levels of this economy and 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 also the small businesses that rely on you know rely on trade or the small businesses that work within trade and so when you look at the inflationary pressures um, you know, we are going to see some of this. I mean, look what's going on, as you pointed out, with the cost of borrowing. I mean, it's going up. And so all of this moving forward, um, you always have to say, you know, many, many months ahead. But with these tea leaves, and I'm constantly, you know, I constantly beat my head against all this, containers don't lie. Yeah. Look at the flow yeah. of the containers. Look what's going on. What does that tell you? Don't wait for some six-figured pompous guy that gets paid a lot of money to finally say that, oh my goodness, the second year, second half of the year is not going to be good. Well, no kidding. It's not going to be good. I, I told you three months ago, you know, when the orders were coming in and they were down. So there's so much information and people need to really value the data that they have. Because I think if you really analyze the data that you have in your wheelhouse, you're able to kind of think ahead and maneuver and pivot. Because in logistics, if you don't pivot, you're going to hit that pothole, and it's going to be costly. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. You have an amazing weekend. Everyone go check out her work on CNBC and, of course, on FreightWaves.com as well. Thanks. Take care. All right, everybody. Um, hold on. I got a couple of comments here. Morgan says this should – I think he's talking about yellow here. This should take a bit to shake out, but eventually people will be needed. A. Gionchi says, was a great company in the 80s and 90s. I'm retired now, but I, I had a great terminal. Manager, salespeople, and VPs of operations to go get stuff moved 24-7. Sad day for all. Yeah, I mean, it's a company that touched um, a lot of people. A lot of people. Thank you for your comments, by the way. we got to tip the band again here. What the Truck is sponsored by Last Mile Delivery Leader Freight. When you need the best Last Mile Delivery drivers and vehicles, look to Freight. Sign up and get your first three deliveries free up to 300 bucks. Go to Freight.com and use the code FIRST3FREE. That's Freight. F-R-A-Y-T. Elsewhere.
The first thing you need to do when hauling milk is crack open the manhole cover because if you don't, the pressure of the milk will literally explode it open. There's a lot of steps in the process and every dairy is different, but the concept is the same. Connect the hose to your trailer and start pumping milk quickly and carefully. But after you connect your elbow adapter, you need to disconnect the hose from the pipes and connect the hose to the elbow. And the reason there's water in the hose is because after each pump, you need to wash out the pipes, including the hose. So there's usually water in the system that you need to drain out before you can start pumping. And once you tighten everything up, put a hitch pin through the metal rod that's extremely important because if you don't you're asking for a disaster now it's time to go inside and play connect four with the pipes according to what tank you're pulling milk from and this part requires using your brain so if you think crypto is a future you probably wouldn't understand then finally you can turn on the pump and it's as simple as that the milk goes from the tank in the dairy to the tank on your trailer through a four inch hose and after about 25 minutes or so, your tank should be full. But while you're waiting, it's a good idea to collect your samples for the processing plant. So grab your sample dipper and spray the heck out of it with iodine to kill off any bacteria and then dip it into the tank until you get a clean sample. You know it's a clean sample when you no longer could see iodine on your dipper. So fill up your two sample bottles and immediately put them into your ice chest. It's now been 27 minutes and the tank is full. So with that being said, it's time to close up shop and seal the manhole. This job isn't as dirty as commodities, but you do come home smelling like milk every day and it absolutely destroys whatever clothing you're wearing. Now that you seal the manhole, you basically undo everything in the same order you started with, starting with closing the butterfly valve and shutting off the pump. I did milk hauling as a company driver and then as an owner operator, but for Very liability cool. reasons, I great had to video. step down because the processing great, plant didn't Great, great video. I, it, uh, although, <laughs> when you see milk in a tanker like that, I'm not sure it's like as appetizing when it's coming in like an oil tanker as it would be. We got Jamie Hagen here, owner at Hellbent Express. Hey, Jamie, ever milk a cat? How's it going, sir? <laughs> you ever you ever milk a cat, Jamie? It's going good. Cool, man. Can can you hear me okay? Yeah, a little bit. Just having some technical difficulties. You you caught me on the fly here. Oh, it's cool. Where are you right now? I'm in Toledo, Ohio. I delivered in um in Detroit earlier at uh Walmart DC and I, I literally just got to my parking spot when we decided to do this. Well, hey, uh, Jamie, um, any thoughts on yellow? The so big news came down today. They're winding down over there. We're hearing from everybody. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? Um, I know a few guys from YRC in, in South Dakota there, uh, probably pretty good friends with them. And the fact that the, they're going to be going through this is kind of scary. Um, I mean, huge organization for it to go down like that. It's nuts, right? Yeah, it is nuts. It is nuts. It kind of puts everyone like a little bit on edge too when when stuff like that starts happening in the market and and dominoes start falling. But Hellbent Express does well. What, people who don't know though, why are you out there with that truck? What's Hellbent Express up to? Well, we do a lot of dry van stuff. We're we're out here fighting the good fight with everybody else right now, right? Like just uh, out here in the market, uh, trying our best, really. Just how many like, trucks? <laughs> how many hopefully trucks not you got? to yellow out on this deal. How many trucks you got out now, Jamie? Technically, we got 12. We got uh, two owner operators. I guess that puts us at 14 all together in the fleet. Why a Mac guy, though? Why, why the Bulldog? Why the Mac? A lot of guys like the white Volvos, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Mac trucks. You know, they just celebrated their birthday. Was it yesterday? I think yeah. it was. 123 years. I mean, uh, the original truck manufacturer in the United States, right? Did you see that Lego they did in person, that giant full-size semi? Jamie? Hmm. His connection's a little rough. His connection's a little rough from where he's coming in from. Hopefully we can get him back connected. Maybe you guys can technical difficulty him. Keep me updated on the board over here, and uh, we'll bring him back up if, if we can. Because I really want to get into fuel. And the reason why is we'll show the fuel chart really quick. I'll speak to it a little bit. Show this sonar fuel chart. Look right here. This is skyrocketing. This is up to three, three point nine seven eight. Sorry, I can't speak today. That's a diesel truck stop price per gallon average for the United States, and you've seen it skyrocket since the twenty fourth. Um, I was talking to Donnie before I went on air. He said there's a good chance that this could go up even higher. So that's gonna that's something to watch right here. The other thing he was saying is we got heating fuel coming in, and that usually starts ticking up around. Well, that's right. That map right there that's showing you the United States. This is a heat map of diesel fuel prices where you're gonna get the most expensive. I drive by. You can keep that up. I'll talk to that. Uh, <laughs> I drive by a Circle K all the time every day in work, and I've been seeing like diesel is down to like I don't know, beginning of the month it was like three dollars and two cents, and now it's 
I don't know, three seventy, dollars maybe almost $4. It's just going up really, really fast. California, always a hellscape. You know it. I know it. Everyone knows it, except maybe some Californians. Very, very expensive to get your fuel over there. When Jamie comes back, he may have some tips on that. I am not sure if he will. So let's take a moment of zen. Well, they try to bring him back up. I don't know if they if they will at the moment, so let's just go to good news, bad news. Ah, the bad news and good news. Yeah. All right, man. F3 is coming up. I would love to take one of these down the Tennessee River. Take, take a look at this uh, pontoon semi-truck. Now, I showed you the one that was on... Um, that was on the Great Lakes. What was that, back in June, right? This is a different one. Do you guys like this? I mean, it's just aesthetic, right? You're just putting like a semi-truck cab on the front of a pontoon. I think it looks pretty sick, though. You real cold on that? You anger people with that thing? Nah, be nice on the water. Be nice on the water. Here's a scary video. So, bad news, you're driving down the road and some idiot hits your truck while you're driving with your dog. Here's the good news, though. The boy's okay. Got volume on this? As you can see here, this driver's coming. Someone comes out of nowhere. His dog's on the passenger seat next to him, and he gets jostled right off the thing. Fortunately, he's back on there. He's looking at his owner like, what the hell happened here, Daddy? Fortunately, he is okay. It looks like we might not get Jamie back. He's over in that uh, warehouse and receiving location, so... I'm not sure what's going on. So we'll go through good news, bad news. We'll dump some ice on my head, and we'll end whenever that is. Guys in the back. Um, this guy over here, speaking of lucky, we talked about Spencer Hyde, the dude who drove underneath the truck and uh, survived. This guy here, let's play this one twice so you can actually see what happened. Because the first time I saw this, I was like, was that guy in the road the entire time? But he wasn't. When you see when this thing loops back on here, I'm not entirely sure what this person was doing. Were they trying to like hitchhike a ride? Let's take a closer look. He's hanging on to the side, and he falls. Is that his own truck? I have no idea. Is this in Europe? And it drives right over him. He's lucky he did not get squashed like a bug. Well, gentlemen over here, <laughs> here's the good news. You're driving around in your little Mario Kart. <laughs> You're driving around the streets of San Francisco in your little Mario Kart. When the police come by, you decide to throw some shells at them. You threw the red and blue shells at my vehicle. Is that illegal? Yes, sir, it's vandalism. I'm gonna hop it so far in your vehicle. Bruh. Hey, man. Can you step out? Yes, sir. What's gonna pop me to get it back? You got gold coins? It's a meat, mom. You always got gold coins on. No, that's, that's the only way. Alright, we good. You drive safe. Excellent. Oh, yeah, Christian out here. Uh, you know, I was challenged recently. I haven't heard of this thing since 2000. I think it was like 2014 when the ice bucket challenge went viral. But then Freight Caviar, he uh, he's very influenced by like Korean K-pop stars, apparently, because this movement, the Korean uh, K-pop stars have been bringing this back and Korean influencers have been bringing it back to TikTok. So he put a video where Christian Giblis was dumping a bucket of water on his head. He cha he challenged Mr. Please Advice himself, Reed loosed a lot. And uh, well, let's take a look at that video. I'd like to thank Peanut Butter and Jelly for nominating me for the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's cold. Uh, Dooner, Timothy Dooner, I nominate you. <laughs> Please advise when you will be able to complete this uh, Ice Bucket Challenge. Thank you. 
So Reed, thank you very much for challenging me, shining a light on what's going on with ALS and everything going on there. Happy to do this ice bucket challenge over here. Christian, uh, Christian me with <laughs> this bucket of water. Happy ice bucket challenge. Keep it, keep it coming, keep it, keep it coming down. I challenge you, Matt McClellan, no wreck, coming in right here on this floor, over the dump, a bucket of water on your head. Everybody else, keep the movement going, shine some light on this issue. Thank you for joining us on What the Truck. Find me on social media at Timothy Dooner. Find the show at FW What the Truck. Look up the show wherever you get your podcast. We'll bring Jamie back on another time. I gotta go get a towel because I'm freezing. Take care and don't be a stranger.